Now, final speaker before lunch uh, is uh, Stefan Ingvarsson, who works as an analyst at the uh, Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. In the years 2015 to 2020, he was Councillor for Cultural Affairs at the Swedish Embassy in Moscow. Uh, his presentation highlights how cultural heritage has become a part of the conflict in Ukraine after Russia's full-scale invasion. Please give a warm welcome to Stefan Ingvarsson. Thank you. I'm very glad to uh, follow up where Frederick and Anna and Sofia uh, left us, because when speaking of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine and cultural heritage, we often talk about the focus is usually on what has been destroyed, what is threatened with destruction, and must be documented, protected, and secure, for obvious reasons. But I think it's the intent behind uh, certain aspects of this destruction is what we should analyze. And I am very glad that Frederick pointed this out because this is usually not heard within the larger security discussion uh, here in Sweden. I would like to uh, start with what's obvious. So the obvious thing is, uh, I'm pointing this Sorry. Um, I'll start with the obvious aspect of destruction, uh, because this is where we can see the intent. This is the local museum in Ivan Kiev. It's um, a village northwest of Kiev. And uh, it housed um, quite ordinary um, uh, historical and regional museum of the type that you can find in almost every Soviet uh, or former Soviet town uh, in Eastern Europe. But it also housed a big collection of the self-taught artist Maria Primachenko, an icon of naive art and really an icon of uh, Ukrainian art history. And the whole story has a bit of a twist, because when this facility was attacked, uh, it was highlighted, of course, by Ukrainian authorities as, a, as an intent, a destruction with intent of a museum and a big art collection. Few people knew that the collection had been saved. And uh, if we're looking at Russian intent, I think it's important to look carefully at this thriller of events. So uh, this village is close to the Belarusian border. Uh, we know that uh, Russian armed forces used Belarus uh, to enter Ukraine. So they entered through Belarus, marching on Kyiv, and on their way they passed this village. They uh, destroyed several buildings with intent, and when uh, this museum was put on fire, uh, a museum worker, uh, the partner of this museum worker, plus a civil servant who used to work with cultural issues in the village, managed to save 14 paintings, paintings by Maria Primachenko. And they did it taking them physically out of this uh, burning uh, building. But the thing is, they were, I mean, when speaking of civil preparedness, they not only rescued the paintings, they also hid them. And they hid them in a place that only one person knew, and then they made sure that this person was not available for interrogation and torture. So they understood from the very beginning the playbook. What would happen? Because when the soldiers inspected the building and saw that artwork was missing inside, they started interrogating the villagers because they had instructions to make sure that these paintings were either destroyed or confiscated. And uh, when we're speaking of intent in this war and what the Russian armed forces are aiming at, it's very important to understand what Frederick highlighted earlier, that cultural heritage, cultural identity is a, a political tool in, regaining, in, in gaining control over 
uh, political control over what is Ukraine. So uh, this is why I wanted to start with the, the most obvious thing. And here is a little advertisement because uh, Maria Primachenko's uh, work will be shown at Moderna Museet in Malmö. So if you're in southern Sweden this autumn, starting September, you should definitely go there and see this naive art, which looks cute, but in fact shows the very violent history of the Ukrainian 30s and 40s. And many of these paintings, I mean, this could be a metaphor for what happens when uh, um, a person used to open debate and other perspectives is faced with Russian propaganda entering his or her ears. But it's actually very much about the Soviet experience during the Holodomor, the um, intentful uh, starving of Ukrainians in the 30s. So at its core, the Russian full-scale invasion is a military attempt to erase Ukraine as a political entity, but its targets are its history, culture, language, and heritage. And we keep forgetting how close Russian armed forces were to succeeding back in February 2022, and how miraculous the turn of events actually was, or not, you know, in any way uh, given. Ukraine's museums, monuments, and libraries are a threat to the Russian regime because they are part of the fabric that holds Ukrainian identity and therefore resistance together. The fabric that binds together civil preparedness. And that's why they are intentfully targeted. This war is as much about culture and identity as it is about land because Russia understands cultural heritage as a tool. It is as much about defending physical structures and objects as it is about defending their context. And this is my main point. It's very much about defending the context of the heritage. The right to define and interpret your heritage within a free, independent and democratic society. Kasir Fatemi uh, referred to memory, and memory is an important part of this. Uh, memory gives heritage a context, but it's also about the free and open debate about this meaning and context. This is what's also at stake in this war. It's easy to frame this war as a conflict of two different national identities, two different national ways of understanding Eastern European history. It's not. I mean, to some extent it is, but not only. It's very much about Russia uh, enforcing a static interpretation of heritage upon a society that has a discussion about who they are. Let's uh, look closer at Lenin. Lenin started disappearing in Western Ukraine soon after the country became independent in 91. But uh, in most parts of Central and Eastern Ukraine, the phenomenon of Leninopad, let's call it its reigning Lenins, uh, in English started uh, during the Revolution of Dignity in late uh, 2013, early 2014. And it could be described as the visual decoupling of Ukraine from both its Soviet, and Soviet past and its Russian neighbor, seeking its own destiny as an independent European country. And this was met by continuous outrage and bad press in Russia. And here comes the paradox. No one cares about Lenin in today's Russia. No one. Few things are as outdated in the thinking of today's Russian establishment as the goals, ideals of the Bolshevik party, uh, some of their methods perhaps, but for sure not their radical vision of a communist society. When the centennial of the so-called revolution, the Bolshevik coup, uh, was commemorated in Russia, no one knew what to say. Because no one has anything contemporary to say about Lenin and the Bolshevik coup. But, and on the contrary, Putin's rhetoric is about restoring traditional conservative values, the Orthodox Church, and so on. And he also blames Lenin for inventing Ukraine as a concept 
and this is used in his rhetoric in this war. So what is the first thing that the Russian occupying forces are doing after securing a territory and detaining those who, had, who they had on previously prepared lists? You know? It's reinstalling Lenin. The first thing that the Russian occupying forces do when they uh, occupy a town or a settlement is putting Lenin back on the main square. Also changing the names of streets and so on. But Lenin is very, very important here. And uh, because Lenin's presence is a symbol of normality, every Russian settlement, village, town has Lenin in its main square, except for Kaluga, but that's for another occasion. Uh, so Lenin means normality. He does not signify anything symbolic for Putin's regime. He just signifies the lack of someone taking him out of the public space. So it's the lack of Lenin that is symbolically important here, not the presence of Lenin. Lenin must be there for a place to be normal and Russian. So try, be I mean, try beating all these paradoxes here. But so someone in Putin's Russia today is producing contemporary Lenins. Here is the changing of road signs. Uh, I'll go very quickly through this. Uh, my, the whole idea is that um, also street names contain, from a Russian perspective, normality. And normality here being the different layers of Russian imperial past, Soviet imperial past, that need to be present for something to be normal according to what is Russian reality today. And the important thing for our understanding of how to defend ourselves is that Russia will always meet us with the idea that history is holy, and it's a source of moral legitimacy for a regime that has very few other sources of legitimacy. So you should look at it as a kind of animal that needs to feed on the concept of the victory in World War II as the only source for moral legitimacy and strength. So there's no other things. I mean, my friend Sergei, a Russian writer, he usually describes contemporary Russia as Think of the storage room full of symbols, um, mixed symbols, imperial symbols, Soviet symbols. And then think of a TV studio next to the storage room. And think of the regime's propagandists as trying to carry sometimes an eagle, sometimes a red star, sometimes something linked to World War II into the studio to see if it resonates, if it has any warmth. If it could be used to uh, convey a message uh, in the propaganda. And if, there, if you can detect any radiation, warmth, or anything in the symbol, then, then you would use it. But the next day, you would take a symbol from a completely different context, and then you would look at the temperature of this symbol and see, will this work? So there's no logic in the use of symbols. It's just trying to find the symbols that resonate with the audience in any way, that, that raise any type of emotion. And, I mean, uh, you can say a lot of, about this because, of course, uh, history has, has here been uh, washed into an entirely Russian affair, although World War II played out mostly in Belarus and Ukraine although most of the civilian victims were Belarusian and Ukrainian and so on. But in this narrative, uh, this is a Russian affair today. And uh, everyone that opposes this, opposes this narrative becomes a Nazi only because the logic of World War II is that there's a we and there's a them and they are Nazis. So that's the only reason why Ukrainians are Nazis, because the logic of this thinking requires a we and a them, and the them in this narrative is always the Nazis. There are uh, more weird paradoxes in this um, war when it comes to cultural heritage. Um, 
but I will skip it because I only have one minute left, and I really want to go to Bashkortostan because I want to uh, highlight that what is happening in Ukraine also gives us an understanding of how Putin's regime uh, is dealing with other narratives within, within the Russian Federation. So, uh, if we were asking ourselves as analysts of Russia five, six, seven years ago, uh, what the Putin regime really intends to do with other ethnic narratives, with other languages, with uh, in indigenous perspectives inside Russia, the war in Ukraine gives us an answer. Not necessarily because the Russian regime or Putin's regime had this answer five, six, seven years ago, but because the war has kind of formulated an answer to this. Putin is balancing between an empire and a nation state. There's always a, a very fragile balance here. He cannot exclude entirely the almost 200 ethnic minorities that live in Russia. Some of them are quite resourceful and have a position like the Tatars. And uh, some of them live in remote areas like the people who live around this mountain in Bashkortostan. This mountain uh, is part of their historical heritage. It was a sacred site. It has a twin mountain that was uh, explored and excavated in Soviet times. There's nothing left of it. It has become baking soda and cement. The thing is, there's a lot of limestone inside the Russian Federation. You could excavate a lot of other sites, but for some reason, these sites that also were protected in Soviet times and has been confirmed as protected in Russian times are excavated. And this has uh, erupted uh, a new unexpected protest in Bashkortostan in rural areas among people who are usually not considered liberal, anti-regime, uh, or who are connected to you know, a liberal or independent media discourse in Russia. These are people who have had enough and who realize that what's going on in Ukraine is affecting them. So I would just like to come back in my reasoning that will now be very short. This is, uh, this is a Tatar princess that I just leave with you here as a sign of different ways of interpreting uh, uh, the Volga River's history and who was there first and uh, what kind of cultural heritage it contains. But going back to Ukraine, uh, taking with us the understanding of how cultural identity and culture is used as a tool right now by Putin's regime, both in Ukraine and inside Russia, we are seeing a kind of escalating snowball. I'm not sure, uh, I'm one of those who are not sure if Putin really had, or from the very beginning had an ideology, I would claim that he didn't. But the snowball has acquired an ideology by using culture and cultural heritage and cultural identity as a political tool. Once you start doing it, it becomes an ideology. It becomes a force. It becomes what this war and this regime is about in its survival, uh, in its attempt to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Very interesting. Uh, Frederick and also Sofia and Anna and you all touched upon the political and, and uh, military purposes of cultural heritage. Uh, has this always been in Russia's DNA? And also when you were talking about the, the cultural heritage of minorities, is there any kind of uh, forces within the borders of Russia that can counteract this? What are your views on that? Two uh, big two, questions. Yeah, yeah, two big uh, questions yeah. The first question I'll answer very briefly. Uh, Frederick touched upon uh, the understanding that existed in the Soviet Union. I would also stress the understanding that existed within the KGB, 
when it was fighting uh, what it saw as national extremism uh, in the late Soviet Union in the 80s, primarily Ukrainian and Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian uh, uh, national identity that was emerging and, and kind of uh, finding new contemporary forms and shapes and understandings in the late Soviet Union. And how the KGB targeted all of this is so much part of their fabric and because the KGB is central to Putin's regime and uh, to the education that many of the central figures in Russia today had. This is what shaped them. The 80s in the KGB is what shaped them. And the 80s in the KGB was very much about fighting national identity that was different from the Soviet and mainstream Russian ones. So this is very much in their fabric. Mm. And yes, I mean, when it comes to Russian actors, there's always the question, will they be an actor of change or will they have any decisive role to play internally? Um, it's a long discussion. Mm. Uh, mm. I would say that once the window of opportunity appears in Russia, uh, they're one of the instruments we have. We have two instruments. One of them is our support for Ukraine. The second instrument are sanctions and uh, other uh, ways of containing Russia, uh, also military deterrence. Our third way is supporting those actors inside Russia that might be uh, maybe not an agent of change, but a factor in the change that one day will come. Uh, I'm not sure that their role will be decisive, but we cannot really... Uh, not support this instrument because it's one of the three that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you.